Karen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, David. Thank you for uh, speaking with me. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's my honor to have you on my show. That you're the first person from Russia. First, uh, you're the, uh, I have another friend from Russia, but he lives in Ukraine. So I did the interview him the, last week. But from Russia directly, you are the first person. Great honor. Great. Yeah. Great honor. So, yeah. Can you, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to founding the Revo Technology? I think you have a very, very long and journey with a lot of experience. So make it long story short. Please tell me about yourself. Okay. Well, um, uh, uh, originally I uh, grew up in, um, in uh, the Soviet Union in Ukraine and with my family, we emigrated to the United States when I was uh, just a teenager. And so mm -hmm. I went through my you know, education and my um, early career years in the United States. Um, uh, after business school, um, it was a very um, interesting time to return to Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, the Soviet Union had broken up. And yes. um, a lot of the... Um, um changes that uh, were um, um going to happen uh, coincided with the time when you know i finished my education finished business school and uh, was ready to uh participate in um in the reopening and uh rapid development uh, that um russia was anticipating in the early 1990s and so i was one of the first uh, people to join um mckinsey in Russia, um, in the Moscow office, um, right out of business school. And um, I spent um, over 20 years at McKinsey. Uh, I became a senior partner um, based in Moscow and uh, working across Central Eastern Europe, CIS, um, uh, focusing on financial institutions. So I worked um, uh, really in uh, some of the most important developments that took place in the banking sector and the insurance sector and the stock exchanges uh, in that geography. Um, I was involved in, for example, uh, creating the very first consumer lending company in Russia. I was involved in um, setting up um, credit bureaus, collection agencies, um, um, I uh, did work for the stock exchange. I worked on launching the very first uh, kind of mass market uh, car insurance um, uh, product. So it was really a tremendously exciting time to be creating uh, from scratch together with, um, you know, Russian entrepreneurs, um, uh, new businesses that have gone on to become um, you know, extremely uh, valuable and extremely important in the economy. Um, and then um, in about 2013, um, uh, really, I started to uh, read and see um, uh, new opportunities uh, in fintech uh, with changes in technology, um, with introduction of mobile technology, software as a service, um, uh, artificial intelligence, those kinds of technologies. And um, they really uh, fascinated me, um, and I felt that you know working with big traditional banks, I really wouldn't have a chance to um, learn as much as I could about those technologies because I felt they were very slow to um, implement new technology. Um, and so I started to get involved in, let's say, the startup scene in Russia. Uh, looking at potential fintech uh, uh, new venture opportunities, initially as an angel investor. And um, uh, in, 2000, in late 2012, uh, Revo was founded and I was initially um, angel investor um, kind of slash co-founder in the company. Um, and uh, Revo, from, from the beginning, um, my partner and I, uh, we felt that there was tremendous opportunity to reinvent how financing is offered in stores. Uh, we had seen that uh, for decades in other markets, in Turkey yep. and Brazil. And uh, we felt that uh, with uh, new technology, we could really dramatically improve the experience. And that's why we chose that space. And um, in 2013, we introduced our very first 
uh, product um, uh, for um, uh, for retail in Russia. It was uh, originally like an MVP version of our service, uh, but already on mobile devices, uh, which made it quite groundbreaking at the time, um, paperless and on mobile devices. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we saw that the company started to really uh, take off. There was a lot of interest from major retailers. And uh, by 2015, uh, uh, the company was raising the first uh, equity round and um, it was a good time for me to leave McKinsey and join Revo uh, uh, on a full-time basis and focus on building the company. Yeah, I think you made the right choice. I'm also from the finance world last three decades. And uh, I mean, uh, I interviewed a more than 100 entrepreneur and investor uh, on my podcast. And then everybody talk about the, I mean, four, four or five industry we have to disrupt. And for the huge potential is uh, banking and then uh, telecom business, education, healthcare, because those are the very traditional highly regulated and protected. So if you, they find a way to uh, disrupt through the technology, very easy to grow the business, right? Yeah, so I agree. Yeah. I guess retail has already been disrupted and yes. travel has been disrupted. Right. And so I agree with you. It's time for some of these other um, industries to uh, deal with technology. Yeah, interestingly, finance world, uh, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, the bank and finance company tried a lot of new product provider solution, but now going through the couple of global financial crisis, it is now more regulated, much more regulated by the government. So people, I mean, my friend, uh, mostly from banking finance, they said, we don't need to smart people anymore, anymore, any longer in the finance industry because it's highly regulated. Nothing we can do about it, about the new solution or something, right? So yeah. that's interesting. I mean, in point. fact, they have more people in these organizations who say no to things than people right. that say yes to things. So, you yes. know, the size of their compliance departments and legal yes. departments. Yes. And, it has uh, become much bigger. Accounting Co departments is much bigger than yes. the then, product and technology teams. Yes. That's what, that, that's what I agree. Something like a United Nation to, in order to make one decision for one agenda, it takes a lot of time, right? A lot of pain and efforts. I agree. Yes. Uh, yeah, since you are the first guest from Russia, I have a lot of questions. In fact, I know the Russia because it has been superpowers of many, many decades. And I, Russia, uh, I mean, the large, world largest nation in terms of, I mean, the land, land size and the home to the over 30% of global natural resources and so many good things about Russia. So uh, when I look at the business in Germany, for example, as a comparison, they developed a lot of technology during going through the world war, right? Because they need to survive and fight and survive. They've developed a lot of technology. And based on the, those technology uh, that are developed, uh, I mean, some, so many decades, they grow and then expand internationally. But interestingly, I haven't seen a lot of Russian tech startup in Asia, other part of the world. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, startups in uh, uh, Russia, and then what is the strength and opportunity there? Um, well, Russia has a number of uh, very important uh, sectors in the economy. Um, I would say uh, the more traditional sectors like oil and gas and natural resources continue to be the dominant uh, sectors in the economy, um, despite many years of, uh, you know, the government looking for ways to diversify um, um, in a way uh, because natural resources are so abundant and yes. still so much in demand around the world. Uh, this has become Russia's um, you know, key um, export uh, to the world is uh, natural resources. At the same time, I would say Russia has actually quite um, an impressive um, technology and entrepreneurial um, uh, eco uh, system or environment. Um, uh, there is a, let's say, quite strong computer science uh, capability, strong math and physics uh, education. And so um, you actually see some very interesting, um, you know, uh, technology uh, ventures emerging. Um, 
uh, unfortunately, some of these companies or some of these entrepreneurs leave to build their businesses overseas. And so uh, you do see a lot of Russian entrepreneurs being quite successful um, in the US and elsewhere. Uh, but you also see quite, uh, you know, quite um, uh, impressive technology companies in Russia, for example, uh, Yandex, uh, which is uh, uh, the equivalent of, I guess, uh, Google, which is a local um, Initially, it was a local search engine, um, but has become uh, a very strong player um, uh, within Russia, um, certainly competing uh, head on with, with uh, Google um, for, for, you know, in the advertising uh, market. Uh, they've also expanded into um, mobility markets. So they have, um, you know, the leading taxi service, the leading um, food delivery uh, business and so on. Yes, uh, I, I heard that uh, in Nepal, I interviewed the uh, largest e-commerce company in Nepal. They say that they have a ride-hailing company from Russia in Nepal now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, there is, um, uh, so Yandex is, is you know, one, uh, let's say, very successful example of a Russian tech company. Uh, there is a few others like um, um, uh, the Mail.ru group which has, um, you know, the leading social, um, social networks, uh, VK and uh, OK, um, which uh, dominate the market and compete with um, Facebook and Instagram. Um, there is um, um, a number of very successful uh, online marketplaces that have emerged, uh, like Wildberries and Azon, um, which are, um, you know, tremendously successful. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, there's also companies like Kaspersky, which has become a global player in, uh, antivirus, uh, software. Um, so, uh, I would say, uh, there is quite, um, you know, quite an exciting and quite an interesting, uh, tech sector. Um, I guess the issue is that, um, you know, very few of these companies have been successful at becoming global companies. They're very successful domestically but with very few exceptions um, have not gone beyond Russia um, um, to, you know, to build on their success. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. For example, there is um, uh, soon to IPO, actually one of the top global ride hailing companies, which is actually based in, in, um, in, uh, in the Eastern part of Russia, uh, started from there, from, a pretty small town and have expanded, you know, throughout Asia and, and globally. Um, and I think that's one of the, um, let's say, opportunities and challenges for, you know, Russian tech companies to, um, you know, to, to go global. And we can discuss, you know, what are the obstacles to that? Um, but um, but um, indeed, there have been, you know, uh, not so many examples as one would expect. Yes, I as I uh, say as I told you the uh, last week that I interviewed the ex CEO of a uh, state-run uh, telco in the Ukraine. And then we talk about a similar topic. He mentioned that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, successful entrepreneur tech entrepreneur, but instead of uh, starting the, their business in Ukraine, many people went to immigrate U.S. first and then grow the business there. So people don't recognize it is uh, uh, founded and run by the. Ukraine entrepreneur. It's, uh, it feels like uh, Russia has a similar cases. Uh, some Very people, similar, yeah. Right, yeah, interesting, very interesting. So uh, Russia in, is well known to the people around the world, outside of Russia, a lot of technology. Uh, I, 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 uh, somehow people think that the Russian people is very good at the maths. That's a c common understanding <laughs> of Asian people. Like Ukraine people say the same thing, right? They're good at the math and then technology engineering. So then it's, uh, there is a something good, some, some strengths in Russia, Russian community. And then the Asia has a growing market in some of the population. So it's, in fact, last year, I learned from the Financial Times that Asian economy as a whole has become larger than uh, the rest of the world for the first time since 19th century. So PPP base. So it's, a, it's amazing. Great, great momentum. Of course, that's yeah. quite uh, amazing. Uh, then it's... Uh, what is the way? What is your thought? How we can, because there are a lot of good things, but uh, uh, in order to build the business, grow business, we need to come up with the idea to collaborate 
leverage or all, every, every strength, uh, I mean, everyone has in the different region, then we can have a greater synergy. So what is your thought? How we can collaborate? I mean, sometimes Russia is classified as Asia, right? Part of Asia, but the, still, <laughs> I mean, people think that Asia is a China, Japan, Korea is a Southeast Asia. What is the rest of Asian country and the economy uh, uh, I mean, the best way to collaborate with uh, resources and talent in, in, in Russia. What is your thought? Well, I, I think um, um, what's interesting is that indeed Russia is an Asian economy. Right. Yes. Um, and Russia has, you know, longstanding uh, economic ties with Japan and China, um, um, obviously North Korea and um, Vietnam. Yes. Um, so um, there are those um, historical links uh, that right. can be built. Uh, for example, uh, some years ago, I worked with uh, some banking institutions in Vietnam uh, when I was still at McKinsey, and I was surprised to see uh, the chairman and the CEOs were all fluent Russian speakers. In fact, that, that is what I was about to say. Sure. I have I have met so many CEO chairman from sure. uh, Russian educated in Vietnam. Of course, of course. Um, I think Vin so, Group as well. Vin Group, largest yes, group in the Vin uh, Group. group. Um, Masan, Masan, uh, 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 Techcom Bank. Techcom is one of the largest. Yes, Techcom Bank. Um, yes, yes. Very interesting. So, um, it is very interesting. So there are those historical ties, and you know they they could speak fluently Russian. Right. Uh, they can also speak English, of course, but uh, let's say they felt quite comfortable, um, you know, speaking in Russian and uh, doing business in Russia. Right. Uh, so um, uh, I would say there are these historical links and ties. Um, um, unfortunately, I think there's not been all that much investment in Russia from Asia. And yes. that's uh, something I think to to be explored uh, why that is the case gap i mean right? there has been investment in you know very focused investment in you know some infrastructure projects uh, some uh, pipeline some um, agriculture uh, but um, but we have not seen you know um, uh, let's say uh, the scale of investment La large in large investor large company sure. right you have sure. i mean I, I mean there's very limited investment from japan um, there are some, um, you know, government investment funds that are joint kind of Russia-China. Uh, there's a Russia-China investment fund, for example, which invests in, you know, technology, early stage technology companies. But, you know, that's quite, I would say, more mm, mm, to say that we have it. I would say it's quite small. The size right. of it is small. It's more kind of quid pro quo, Yes. Political projects rather than, you yes. know, ambitious investments. Right. I think uh, I lived in so many countries uh, throughout my career. And uh, uh, one of the reasons or about the uh, in investment opportunity overseas countries, uh, they don't feel comfortable because they don't have experience. That's the first challenge they have to overcome, right? So a Korean company, for example, they invest in US, Europe, so many Asian countries, but like even among the, their management member employed, they don't they cannot find someone who has uh, who who can say that I understand I a Russian business a Russian community something like that. Then starting point they should have some strong local partner, liable partner, someone like you. Then maybe the big Korean company may jump into the Russian opportunity. Yeah. Sure. Well, again, it is all about people, and it is all yes. about you know looking for those opportunities and trying because um, the opportunities are great. I happen to believe it's a, you know it's obviously yes. a major economy with strong people and tremendous opportunities, um, tremendous entrepreneurial opportunities, um, uh, and I think it, it's an it's an economy that's uh, overlooked for sure. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I think I keep and that's that in. been one of the big challenges for uh, me as an entrepreneur and growing my business. And my yeah. business now is not just in Russia. We are um, we it's operate pending. across Central Europe, so we are in um, Poland, Romania, mm -hmm. uh, and Russia. But I would say one of the big challenges in that geography is actually you know raising global capital. Right. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. I, I'll keep that in mind. Now I, I learn. Now I learn a little bit about Russia, so I'll do the preach about the opportunity in Russia <laughs> to the investor and friend. Yeah.
Yeah. You can be our ambassador. Yes, I'm happy to be. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, we, you have a very interesting conversation about the opportunity in Russia and potential future of a Russian uh, tax scene. So, let's get back to the your business. So, uh, uh, level technology, right? So, what problem are you solving now with the level technology? So Revo technology uh, essentially helps retailers sell more and mm -hmm. help customers um, enjoy more their mm -hmm. shopping experience. Um, we as a company offer, you know, instant paperless buy now, pay later solutions at stores. So we partner with major retailers to embed our technology in their physical stores as well as in their online stores. And through that technology, their shoppers can make purchases now and pay for them in convenient um, installments uh, that they can decide and choose uh, how mm -hmm. to pay. Um, our technology is um, uh, very much leading edge. So uh, any new customer, for example, can uh, be uh, immediately uh, can immediately start to use your service. It only takes us about 10 seconds to make a decision about any new individual that's shopping. Um, and once we uh, have gotten to know that individual, uh, essentially we use all uh, the data uh, that we have about them to um, enable them to use the service over and over again, um, you know, increasing the amount they can spend um of course and never overdoing it so that they cannot pay back so that is something that um we have learned um uh to do over over the past years and technology is really propelling us uh at getting better and better at integrating with stores um approving customers working with customers delivering excellent service to customers um we use quite a lot of global technology in our business so for example we use a number of you know, software as a service providers uh, that uh, that power technology companies globally um, in, in customer care, in decisioning, in, uh, um, let's say, uh, marketing communications, um, in, um, in all our um, uh, data and, and uh, uh, you know, models um, that is all powered by, by um, you know, global technology. Um, we operate in, uh, as I said, in three countries, um, Russia, Poland, Romania. Today, they, that's about 200 million consumers, actually. It's a very, very large market. Um, we have plans to continue to expand in Central Europe. We are, you know, by far the largest by now, pay later in, in that geography. Very good. Yeah, wonderful. Actually, the, I interviewed a couple of the startup who are engaged in the, that are engaged in the, uh, uh, I mean, buy now, pay later business model in Africa as well. Kenya, Kenya one is that their name is Lipa later. Lipa means uh, in pay in Swahili and the later is English. So that I saw that uh, this business model is growing fast everywhere in the world now. Yeah, very trendy. Yes. Very good. Well, it wasn't very trendy when we started the business. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, it was uh, more or less our understanding that you know, let's try this because this has to be, it has to be possible to do this much better. Um, at that point in time, traditional banks that were offering financing in stores, they would have, you know, a paper application form, 35 yes. questions. Um, in some markets like Romania, you actually have to take this form to your work and get your employer to stamp it and provide your income information. I mean, it was absolute hell. And somehow we felt it should be possible to do this instantly and without paper. Yes. Actually, um, the not as it only a... became uh, quite popular, I would say, in the last year or two with some okay. companies like Afterpay and Klarna emerging mm -hmm. uh, globally, uh, becoming well known. Uh, but um, in the early days, um, we were uh, quite lonely, I would say. Yeah, and yes. uh, very few investors believed us that this was an opportunity. In fact, uh... Uh, not as a business of a startup, but I mean, innovative business model. But uh, in the past, I have seen the consumer financing company. It is run by the financing company, not by the startup. So not really uh, based on the technology. But they introduced like a, like a, a 
installment financing, concept of installment finance. If you buy the product in the supermarket, department store, especially the electronic home appliance, they provide a, that uh, installment financing solution. So it has been quite profitable, but uh, I haven't seen that uh, they have expanded uh, internationally. But uh, since the start of find out this opportunity, I think it changed in a different way and grew a different way. Yeah. 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 Okay, got you. So uh, I think I finished most of questions. So what do you have on top of your mind for the next step? Also, the your, yourself as a personally, what is your the I mean I mean the long term vision about for yourself, long term plan of about your professional journey? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, right now the focus is on building Revo mm -hmm. and um, uh, expanding to um, many markets in our geography and taking advantage of the opportunities that we see to uh, deliver uh, our solution. Uh, there's tremendous interest and we are looking at partnering with you know more and more major mm -hmm. retailers. Um, so that's really the focus and I think that for the next, next you know, five, ten years that's going to be where uh, most of my energies are going. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, uh, the key challenges on this journey will be, uh, you know, building a very strong company and a strong culture, and um, um, uh, hiring uh, top talent. Yes, um, that's something that I'm spending a great deal of time on. Um, you know, recruiting talent and building talent. Um, I think people uh, oftentimes don't realize how difficult it is to actually grow quickly because you really have to have the capacity to hire a very large number of people very quickly. Uh, most of the people um, who come from traditional organizations have never experienced this. They don't actually know how yeah, to do I it. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, you know, if you talk to people coming out of traditional companies, you know, you will ask them, how many people did you recruit in the last year? And, you know, they will say, well, I recruited five or 10. <laughs> uh, they will very rarely tell you I recruited 50 or 100 uh, skilled people, not like, uh, you know, administrative, uh, you know, call center people, but skilled people, you know, developers, product people, commercial people. So, um, and that's the kind of, you know, scale we need to achieve. Uh, we need to hire, you know, 50 or 100 skilled people in marketing, in commercial, in risk management, in data science, in IT development. Um, so that's, um, you know, um, a very, very big challenge to do that well, uh, to create that, you know, pipeline of talent us that allows you to grow and multiply right um so that's uh you know one 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 challenge i think we still have to crack i'm um you know trying to figure out how to do that right because a lot of the traditional organizational constructs don't work in that kind of environment you cannot easily have a you know hierarchical organization and you know, try to grow two or three times. So you end up creating lots and lots of uh, yeah. You know, also, yeah, uh, yeah. The yeah. other answer I heard from the entrepreneur, they say that they hire the people, very smart people from the international organization, but they have very little tolerance for ambiguity, right? Because they have a very real structure, real organized. So uh, that doesn't have a good fit with the startup. Right? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, 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 many people struggle to come from an Convert. environment yeah. where, you know, you know, there are policies in place and yes. things just work. And um, I guess they don't realize that things work with or without them. They have very, in fact, they think that they are, you know, very important to their organization, but they realize that um, they realize that actually things just work uh, because they've worked like that for, you know, yes. decades. Uh, now, when they come to our company, you know, of course, we have some people who just absolutely relish that experience, um, you know, the ability to actually put something together that didn't exist before that um, that um, um, requires them to think creatively and get things done quickly. But uh, but also some people kind of struggle with that pace uh, uh, where, you know, literally you know, we cannot wait one year to find out your results. Uh, you kind of have a month or two to start, you know, uh, delivering things. Um, and particularly recruiting, I would say, is a skill that 
um, you know, few people coming out of traditional organizations have uh, truly because most of them don't really recruit all that many people um, into, into, you know, particular teams. Um, uh, of course, as major companies, they, they recruit, but, you know, they really don't double or triple uh, size of their business uh, in any given year. Um, uh, so I would say that's one particular challenge is, you know, doing that, doing that well, um, you know, onboarding people and, you know, building a strong culture um, and a team at the company so with, with kind of strong performance orientation. Um, and I would say uh, the second challenge for us is, um, is uh, raising capital. Um, as I said, our geography, it almost is, uh, it almost feels sometimes like we are on a different planet uh, because um, you read about the billions of dollars of um, investment that is flowing into fintech. Uh, literally every morning I go through fintech news and I hear about this or that startup that's now become a unicorn, uh, you know, after six months, uh, six months after launching. Um, but um, uh, there is very little capital flowing into our geography, even for successful companies uh, like ours. And I, I do believe that we are you know, very successful at what we do. Um, uh, we've, uh, you know, demonstrated year after year, uh, you know, 50, 60% growth. Um, we have been profitable for uh, more than three years, which I think very few fintech companies can say, uh, but we have, uh, um, you know, sustained profitability. Um, and so um, uh, I do believe that, you know, we are uh, one of the successes in fintech, uh, definitely uh, geographically, and um, and still, uh, it's difficult to attract investors um, who simply know little about those markets yeah. and yes. um, essentially, you know, prefer to invest in geographies they they know better. Yes. I, so for us, it's uh, you know, I would say uh, as we grow, as we continue to expand, those are the two most important really challenges that will shape how we as a company um uh, become uh you know three four five years out yes yeah i have another podcast where i interviewed the founder of the venture capital yes so i keep that in mind i, I learned a lot about russia so i keep that in mind yeah and uh, beside running a startup building growing the business of a startup uh, i mean do you have any plan to launch a venture capital to uh <laughs> to induce the capital outside uh, Russia into Russia. I mean, um, potentially, that's, a, that's another that, way uh, to solve the problem, right? That's another way to solve the problem. That's another way to, but then I would not be able to run my company. I, You're right. I think running and building a successful company is a full time job. Right. Um, um, I think, uh, of course, I can be involved in other activities. So I, I do sit on some boards. Um, I recently joined the board of Avian, which is um, a mobile uh, company operating in nine markets, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Russia, Ukraine, um, Kazakhstan, and so on. And they're a publicly listed, quite successful mobile operator. So I, I do have you know, time to be on a few um, boards in addition to running the business, but I would say um, right now what I'm doing is uh, um, quite exciting and more than I can do full time. <laughs> okay, yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. But maybe at the next stage, I would yeah. say once we, um, um, once you know the company, um, let's say can uh, achieve uh, um, my uh, my mission and my vision, uh, maybe I will have some time to dedicate to other activities. Good, very good. Thank you very much for taking time to introduce the great opportunity in Russia as well as uh, about uh, your professional journey and entrepreneur journey, running a startup and growing the business. Thank you, David. Pleasure speaking with you and also uh, learning a little bit about you and what you're doing and um, all the best to you. Thank you.